clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading it loud and clear. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery, Roger, very proud of well, thank you, Andrew, and welcome to the May 29 edition of the Team Space News. Thanks, Peter, and good evening, space fans. Let's go to the moon. NASA awarded Maxar Technologies a contract to build the first element of its lunar gateway. The $375 million fixed-price contract covers the development, launch, and in-space testing of the power and propulsion element which will provide electrical power for the gateway and move it through cislunar space using solar electric propulsion. Maxar will base the spacecraft on its 1300 series bus that it also uses for commercial communication satellites. NASA said it selected Maxar over several other companies because of its technical capabilities and abundant value to NASA at the stated price. Maxar has Blue Origin and Draper as partners for the development of the element, but interestingly has not yet selected, or at least announced, a launch provider. According to NASA, only one other element, a docking and habitation node, is now expected for the gateway before the 2024 human landing, but other modules will be added later. Despite this announcement, companies argue that NASA needs to move ahead quickly on plans to procure one part of its lunar gateway. NASA's new plans for a human return to the moon in 2024 call for the development of a minimal gateway featuring a power and propulsion element and a second module that would serve as a habitat and docking node. While NASA has awarded the contract for the power and propulsion unit to Maxar, it has yet to start the contracting process for the other module. Officials with companies studying prototypes of potential habitation modules said last week NASA needs to get that module under contract in the next year in order for it to be ready in time to support a 2024 landing. The Japanese government may signal its formal intent to participate on the gateway this month. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is expected to sign an agreement on lunar exploration when US President Donald Trump visits the country this week. That cooperation could include providing modules for later phases of the Gateway and other technologies. The Canadian government announced its intent in February to provide a robotic arm for the Gateway, while Europe is weighing its role. The US and Japan are also expected to sign an agreement regarding sharing of space situational awareness information. Meanwhile, the Canadian Space Agency is considering a faster schedule for its contributions to the Lunar Gateway to keep pace with NASA's accelerated return to the Moon. Sylvain Laporte, President of the Canadian Space Agency, said last week his agency's plans to cooperate on the Gateway are evolving after the US government said it sought to land humans on the Moon in 2024, four years earlier than previously announced. That has changed plans for the development of the Gateway, to which Canada has announced its intent to provide a robotic arm. Laporte said Canada could accelerate its work if that would benefit the overall Gateway project. A long-term NASA plan foresees more than three dozen launches to the Moon through to the end of 2028. The internal NASA chart of a, quote, integrated exploration manifest features 37 launches starting this year and ending in 2028. Of these, eight would be space launch system missions and the rest commercial rockets, including robotic landers for the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program and elements of the Lunar Gateway and Lunar Landers. That plan would enable a human landing to the Moon in 2024 with subsequent crewed landings annually for the rest of the time period. Notably absent from the chart is any estimate of the cost of the overall program. A former space industry executive brought in to guide development of NASA's lunar exploration architecture has left after just a month and a half. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine said in a memo last week that Mark Sarangelo had opted to pursue other opportunities after Congress rejected a proposal to reorganise the agency and create a Moon-to-Mars mission directorate. As reported here on Space News, Sarangelo came to NASA last month as a special assistant to the administrator and was considered a likely choice to lead that new directorate if established. 
However, there was criticism of the proposed directorate both inside and outside the agency, with some questioning the need for it and others worried it would be disruptive. India successfully launched a radar imaging satellite last week. A Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, or PSLV, lifted off from the Satish Dhawan Space Centre and placed the RESAT-2B into orbit about 15 minutes later. The satellite will provide synthetic aperture radar imagery for civil and likely military uses. The Indian space agency ISRO announced after the launch that its next launch will be of the Chandrayaan-2 lunar mission in July, a mission that has experienced delays several times. OK, let's head back to the US and SpaceX. SpaceX successfully launched the first set of 60 Starlink communication satellites last week. The Falcon 9 carrying the satellites lifted off from Cape Canaveral and released the satellites into low Earth orbit a little more than an hour later. The rocket's first stage, which had launched and landed on two previous occasions, landed again on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You in the Atlantic. The 60 satellites mark the beginning of SpaceX's deployment of a global internet mega constellation intended to generate more revenue to fuel the company's interplanetary ambitions. SpaceX is suing the US Air Force over awards made to three of its competitors last year, a court document released last week has revealed. SpaceX's bid protest with the Court of Federal Claims challenges the Air Force Space and Missile Systems Center's decision to deny SpaceX a launch service agreement contract as arbitrary and capricious and contrary to law. SpaceX said it proposed primarily using its Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets along with its next-generation Starship system under development for missions in the 2020s. But despite the fact that both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy are flying now, it was given a high risk rating for its ability to launch certain categories of payloads. The company says it pursued the case only after exhausting efforts to discuss the bid with the Air Force, and it is not seeking to stop the ongoing Phase 2 launch procurement. Not surprisingly, perhaps, United Launch Alliance... Northrop Grumman and Blue Origin, who all received launch service agreement awards, have filed motions to intervene in the case. Staying with SpaceX, the US Department of Justice alleges that a SpaceX supplier faked inspection reports for critical rocket parts on 10 missions. DOJ officials last week announced criminal charges against James Smalley, an engineer for a tiny aerospace supply company, for allegedly falsifying dozens of inspection reports for parts used in SpaceX rockets. Smalley was arrested and faces up to 10 years in prison for the charges. The 41-year-old worked in quality assurance for now-defunct PMI Industries, a New York company that specialised in the machining of aluminium and steel parts for aerospace and defence contractors. The alleged fraud affected at least 76 individual rocket parts, according to the DOJ, with Smalley falsifying at least 38 source inspection reports for parts procured by SpaceX for the construction of the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets. In all, the parts were on rockets that were either flown or scheduled to fly on 10 separate missions, according to the Justice Department's complaint. And back to you, Tina. Thanks, Michael. United Launch Alliance has completed the Critical Design Review, or CDR, for its Vulcan Centaur rocket. The system-level CDR, a week-long detailed review of the vehicle, is the final review of the overall design of the rocket scheduled to make its first launch in 2021. While much of the attention the rocket has received was devoted to the choice of its main engines, the company notes that many other components of the rocket have, or will soon gain, flight experience on the existing Atlas V. And in more ULA news... 
The next Atlas V rocket is taking shape at its Cape Canaveral launch pad. ULA started stacking the Atlas V that will launch the AEHF-5 military communications satellite in late June. The launch will be the first Atlas V mission of 2019 and, once completed, will allow launch preparations to begin for an uncrewed test flight of Boeing's CST-100 Starliner spacecraft scheduled for mid-August. Thanks, guys. And Peter Owood has submitted this news, which I will read here in the studio. In the United States, the House Appropriators restored funding to several NASA science missions in its proposed spending bill. They also criticised the agency for abandoning legacy science and education efforts. The report accompanying the spending bill released last week, says appropriators decided to reverse proposed cancellations on the PACE and Clario Pathfinder Earth Science missions and the W-First Astrophysics mission. The report, like the bill, was silent on NASA's request for an additional $1.6 billion for accelerating its plans for a human return to the moon. A rocket launched from Spaceport America last month may be the first built entirely by students to reach space. The University of Southern California's Rocket Propulsion Lab launched its Solid Fuel Traveller 4 rocket on April 21st from the New Mexico spaceport and estimates it reached an altitude of more than 103 kilometres, breaking the 100-kilometre Kármán line that is commonly used as a definition of the boundary of space. Several other colleges had been working to be the first to launch a rocket beyond the Kármán line. Scientists have detected traces of what may be long-lost polar ice caps below the surface of Mars. A radar instrument on NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has detected large deposits of water ice below the surface of the planet's north pole. Those deposits, interleaved with layers of sand, may represent ancient ice caps, according to a pair of research papers published last week. The Russian company Roscosmos is in discussion with S7, the owner of Sea Launch, about moving the system to Russia. Now, Sea Launch is a program in which rockets are launched from a a former oil drilling platform uh, way out at sea. It can be moved to uh, whatever location is required. Now, the Sea Launch vessels remain in port at Long Beach, California, but have not carried out a launch since S7 purchased Sea Launch from Energia. Dmitry Rogozin, the head of Roscosmos, said he talked with S7 about moving the vessels to a port in Russia's far east. He has also discussed developing a modified version of the upcoming Soyuz 5 rocket that, if launched from Sea Launch's floating pad on the equator, would have a payload performance similar to that of the Falcon 9. Meanwhile, A long-delayed Russian module for the International Space Station won't launch until late next year. A Russian industry source said the multi-purpose laboratory module, also known as Nauka, has also now scheduled to launch no earlier than late October or early next year, or November next year. The module has suffered years of delays because of hardware problems, limiting Russian utilisation of the station. And in more Russian space news, International Launch Services hopes to, that closer cooperation with Roscosmos can make the Proton rocket more competitive. ILS is now owned by Glav Cosmos, the arm of Roscosmos responsible for selling Russian space products on the global market. ILS hopes the change gives it closer access to Roscosmos regarding issues such as pricing and schedules. 
Now, ILS markets the proton rocket, which several years ago was one of the mainstays of the commercial launch market, but has fallen out of favour. The ILS company acknowledges that it is a tight market, but says the Proton will remain in service likely through the mid-2020s and remain available for commercial launches. And finally, in tonight's Space News, another mission to Mars means another opportunity to send your name to the Red Planet. NASA announced last week that it is inviting people to submit their names to be etched on a small chip that will fly on the Mars 2020 rover mission, which is due to launch in July next year. A single chip, which is about the size of an Australian five-cent coin, has room for more than one million names. Now, submissions will be open through until the end of September, and it pains me to announce that Jay, a mission controller here on the space show, has beat me to the post, and he's entered his name on, on this thing, and he showed me his certificate earlier today. He's beat me to get my name onto Mars. Oh, well, that's life. <laughs> <laughs> 